Britain, though proud of its parliamentary democracy, had clearly some way to go before it could be called truly democratic. And meanwhile, more than half the population wasn't represented in Parliament at all, another cause of tension in this so-called golden age. These pictures show women protesting for the right to vote. They chain themselves to the railings outside Buckingham Palace. The police drag them away. It's quite a contrast from the image of demure, Edwardian femininity captured by Horace Nichols. But that's what these women were fighting against. The delusion that women were somehow second-rate, a fairer, weaker sex. Women in 1900 were second-class citizens in British society. Working women earned on average just half the salaries of men for the same job. They were excluded from numerous trades and professions. They were barred from most trade unions. And without the vote, they lacked the political clout to challenge this discrimination. The history of women and the history of photography are linked. Because photography was one of those trades people thought was suitable for middle-class women. You read these articles in women's magazines describing photography as genteel and ladylike. But what they meant was portrait photography, studio photography, nice and elegant and safe. But what you didn't get much were women using the camera the way I use a camera, out in the streets, recording the world around them. The exception to that rule, the first British female photojournalist, was a woman called Christina Broom. Mrs. Albert Broom was forced into photography late in life when her husband suffered an accident with a cricket ball. All of a sudden, she found herself in her 50s having to support him rather than the other way around. She bought herself an old box plate camera. She, like Horace Nichols, went to the races. She asked a jockey if she could take a photograph, and it turned out she'd snapped Roxanne, the winner of that year's derby. She sold the snap to the newspapers. It was syndicated, and her career in the competitive male world of freelance photography began. She took pictures of the boat race, of royalty, she set up a postcard shop selling topical views. But the pictures for which she's best remembered show the struggle for women's votes. Apparently she was a bit short, so she'd elbow her way forward through the crowds at the suffragette rallies and set up her tripod as close to the speakers as possible. She took this one on Women's Sunday, a rally in Hyde Park in 1908. For me, this picture has a real sense of immediacy. I think it's because of the low angle. You really feel you're there with them. Women have to obey the law equally with men. Should we not then have a voice in deciding what those laws should be? So many laws have been passed that are unequal for men and women. And these laws won't be changed until women get the vote. The story of votes for women is really two stories two movements, the suffragists and the suffragettes. Christina Broom took photos of both. The suffragists were the moderates. Their methods were peaceful and law-abiding. They believed if an argument was just, then it would prevail. They recruited not just middle-class women, frustrated at their restricted lives, but women workers in the northern mill towns. By 1914, Suffragist organizations had over a hundred thousand members. But their peaceful approach made little headway against the male power structures of Edwardian Britain. And so, from 1903, Emmeline Pankhurst and her daughters set up a rival, more radical organization, the Women's Social and Political Union. These suffragettes argued, don't let's wait to be given the vote. It's ours by right. Let's take it. If that meant breaking the law, 
so be it. Deeds, not words, is our motto. We want the vote. And we can see this so-called liberal government is hostile to us getting the vote. So, we must fight this government until they are conquered or driven from office. Last year, I was caught up in a riot in central London, the May Day riot. I was taking photographs for a newspaper and got caught in the thick of it. I'm looking at these images from 1914 and I'm seeing the same thing. On the one side, you've got these demonstrators with a cause they believe in, for whom any publicity is good publicity. They don't mind being arrested, it makes for good copy. On the other side, you've got the police, under instructions to keep public order. It's a pretty inflammatory cocktail. From 1903 to 1914, the suffragette impact grew. Mass rallies resulted in clashes with the police. Pankhurst and others spent time in Holloway prison. They demanded to be treated as political prisoners. When this was refused, they went on hunger strike. They suffered force feeding. Not surprisingly, on their release, they were treated as heroes. Christina Broom recorded the struggle, her photographs printed as postcards, sold to be collected in suffragette albums, or sent to rally support. My brother asked the other day how could I join such a pack of noisy women and make of myself such a ridiculous nuisance. I replied I liked such methods no more than he did, but that quiet argument for forty years had failed, and now it seems we must shout and beat the drum to catch the public's attention. Of all the publicity stunts of the suffragettes, the most famous and the most tragic was that of Emily Wilding Davison, seen here with the Pankhursts in a picture taken by Christina Broom. In June 1913, Davison went to Epsom. She mingled with the crowd. She pushed her way to the front as the horses approached. Her plan was to rush onto the course as the king's horse, Amna, approached thus throwing the derby. A photographer from the Daily Sketch was standing opposite as she made her move. The photograph he took records what happened next. Amner struck her with his chest and she was knocked over, screaming. Blood rushed from her nose and mouth. The king's horse turned a complete somersault and the jockey, Herbert Jones, was knocked off and seriously injured. An immense crowd invaded the course the woman was picked up and placed in a motor car and taken in an ambulance to Epsom Cottage Hospital. For me, the most extraordinary thing about this photograph is that sense of time suspended. These people at the top here, they're still watching the race. They've not even noticed what's happened. Emily Davison died of head injuries three days later. The suffragettes organised a spectacular funeral. 2,000 suffragettes escorted her coffin. But the more extreme their tactics, the more they alienated contemporary society. They smashed windows, they bombed politicians' houses, and the public recoiled. Look at this. This is extraordinary. A suffragette given police protection from an angry mob. The scene took place in Crickieth, in Wales, in 1913. You read accounts of women caught by anti-suffrage mobs. She's in real danger. A group of men fought their way towards us and they played a kind of rugby football with us, pushing us into the arms of another group, who in turn pushed us on. Two youths held onto my skirt so tightly, I feared it would either come off or I'd be dragged to the ground. Eventually, we managed to board a tram car, the crowd speeding our departure with a shower of cabbages. By 1914, the debate raged. Were the suffragettes' tactics helping or damaging the cause? But then, such questions were swept aside by events on the European stage. <laughs> 